Art making and marketing are very different skills. Even if you're a super talented artist, it's not inherently natural to know how to sell your work online. In a capitalist society, money and life are one and the same. No one in their right mind would ever trust their entire fortune to a roll of the dice. So we're gonna go over a bunch of tips and tricks that I've learned over the last five, six years selling my work online, which has been a large chunk of my income since then. Now the sad news is everybody I've talked to, including famous artists to people just starting out, have all reported that their online sales are down from the year prior. I underestimated this business. This is super unusual, but it's due to a number of factors. One, the US economy is not doing well, AI art is trying to murder us in our sleep, and social media is not as effective at pushing our artwork out there organically as it was a couple years ago. Now this doesn't mean you can't still succeed in the space, and we're going to talk about that, whether that's through your own personal website, Etsy, or another platform. Papa, I want a pistol with a silencer! Sure, if there's one on sale. Now platforms. This is gonna be the first thing, right? What platform to use? Fun thing, I'm not gonna tell you what platform to use because there's a million of them, but I'm gonna tell you the key things that I look out for when deciding on what platform to use. And you can weigh these differently based on your priority on what's important to you. Cost of the platform. Does the shop have a subscription fee to use? Is this subscription fee detrimental? Like how many sales do you have to make each month to just cover the subscription cost? So I suppose the crazier you are, the more you love to gamble. The percent, what percent do they take out of each sale? Now this is a huge one. This can really determine how much money you bring home at the end of the day. The next thing, the aesthetics, setup, and maintenance difficulty. Are the aesthetics of the website nice? Does it make my work or the thing I'm selling look good on their website? Is it easy to set up? Is it easy to maintain? Can I update my shop really easily? Can I put in all the variations? What are the options there? So that's gonna be a big one for me. The next thing, tax collection. Can the website automatically calculate tax and will they collect it for me? And on top of that, another factor, will they pay the tax for me? Will they automatically send taxes to the different states or countries that I need them to? Is that something I'm going to have to do myself at the end of the year when tax season comes along? But a rare feature that I've been seeing is VAT collection or international fees, custom fees. Can you sell internationally without doing a ton of paperwork and collecting all the fees and paying those to those different countries to sell your products internationally to whatever country your customers might be in? So these are all big bullet points I would consider when picking a platform. Now there's another factor to consider. You know, if you're a super famous artist, you have a ton of followers, you have beloved fans who will follow you anywhere and go to your really cruddy personal website that looks like garbage, they're gonna buy your stuff, they love you, they're your fans, right? But if you're just starting out and your goal is growth and discovery, what are you gonna do? You're gonna want a platform with a search engine functionality. And for me, that was Etsy, I think, Etsy is one of the best platforms if you're just starting out. Obviously, you can mix and match platforms. You can have multiple platforms. There's some downsides to Etsy as well. Their percentages are a lot higher than other places, but where I think they shine is their search engine functionality, right? It's pretty much Google for art products or handmade stuff. The general public use Etsy. Everybody has an account on there. That's a big thing. How many sales do you lose from pushing people to your personal website. If I have to put in my credit card on a new website, you know, that takes me time. That might stop me from putting in a purchase. If I just have to click once or twice, trust me, you lose sales from ease of checking out or just being comfortable and familiar with the website. Now, that being said, there's other platforms that have search engine functionality than just Etsy, but that's the one that I use. That's the one I'm familiar with. And again, there's some drawbacks. Their percentage is a lot higher, but the things that they do do, as an example, I think their maintenance is super easy. They collect VAT and custom taxes for me and pay that on my behalf. That saves me a ton of time. They also collect the taxes for every individual state and pay that on my behalf. So I don't ever have to worry about that. The time that it saves me is more than worth that extra percentage for me. Now, if I really needed that extra money, that could be a different story. However, what I've also seen people do is do multiple platforms. So I've seen people who will use Etsy 
just for the custom and VAT tax automatic fees so that they can sell to their international customers. And then they'll push everybody who's like domestic in the US or wherever they may live to their own personal website because the percentage is a lot lower on whatever platform they're using. So you can do a double dip situation if you want. For me, that's too much maintenance. I don't have the time for that. I'm lazy, so I just use Etsy. Again, you can use whatever platform you want. Okay, we've got this covered. We picked the platform. We're ready to go. Step two, make cool shit. Make shit that you would want to buy. What are you buying? If you're making things that you don't even like yourself, that's a big red flag. We already know you're a great artist. You're beautiful. Everybody loves you. Your grandma thinks you're great. We've got that covered. This is a marketing video. I'm not going to teach you how to make cool shit. Go look at Proko's channel. He'll teach you how to draw hands or something. Step three, how do we get people to actually buy your stuff? First off, SEO. What does that mean? Boom. SEO, search engine optimization. So when you're putting in your tags on your product listing, this is how people are going to find you. So you don't wanna describe things kind of, you know, literally, you don't wanna be like, okay, it's an art print, red girl on bike. Maybe that's what the subject matter is, but customers don't know your work. You're trying to get discovered. They're not looking for this specific print. Nobody's gonna type that in. You have to be a bit more generalized and you have to be a bit more like, how is the, the potential customer typing this in. So maybe somebody who's looking for something to hang in their dorm room, they're gonna be like aesthetic wall art, beautiful scenery, right? That's more in the lines of what actual customers, actual people looking for artwork are gonna type into, you know, whatever platform search engine they have. So you're gonna wanna match that as much as possible so your product listing shows up first before anybody else's because they don't know who you are. If they don't see your listing, even if you have a great product, even if you have the perfect thing for that person, if they don't see it, if they're not typing in things that match that product, they're never gonna see it to buy it. Now, a big one for me that I think a lot of people sleep on and forget to prioritize is photography. This is a huge factor in the number of sales I make. Obviously, if you're doing like art prints, it's a little difficult. You just want to put up the file on the product listing. I get it. It works. You'll make sales if it's a good print, right? But if you really want to push the number of sales you're making, show it in an aesthetic way. Show it in a room, on a wall, in a place where it looks really good. Me as a customer, now I can see how your artwork will elevate the space that it's in. You know, especially if you're selling products like, you know, enamel pins, mugs, anything, like whatever you're selling, show it in the space that it'll be used in, but looking really good. Like if you have a certain aesthetic to your work, make sure the space that it's in also matches that aesthetic. Show me where your product is really elevating the space. Remember, this is marketing. This is a different skill than actually making the thing itself, right? So photography, super important. You want your product listing to look way better than everybody else's product listing. That's how people are going to click on it. Photography is a huge factor. So we've got our SEO. We figured out getting our product listing in front of people. Now we're gonna do photography so people actually click on it. What's that? How have we procured these curiosities? <laughs> you don't wanna know. Now let's talk about some platforms to avoid. Now, first off, I would say Patreon. Now, Patreon's a great website if you're established. If you're just starting out and you're trying to grow, Patreon type platforms can be the killer of growth. You do not wanna paywall yourself off from the rest of the world. You want people to be able to easily find your products, easily find who you are, what you're about, and you know, you wanna be loud and proud about what you're selling, what you're doing. So I would say avoid Patreon type websites, even if you're trying to split up between multiple platforms, put that energy into something else that is publicly accessible. It's gonna have a lot more potential for growth, right? At least at the beginning. Once you're established, again, Patreon is a great platform, you know, after that fact. The next thing I would try to avoid is Redbubble and Society6 type platforms. In my opinion, these platforms are more of a scam than anything. The percentage that they give the artist is so astronomical economically small. Now there are some exceptions out there. I've seen people really happy with in print. Again, I think you can make a lot more money just 
shipping and creating your own products and sending them out there. I think Redbubble, Society6 specifically, um, really devalue the market and are not doing much for you as an artist. So I would try to avoid those. Now you might say, hey, I'm really interested in drop shipping. I don't want to keep all this stock, all these prints, or print a ton of things that I don't know if they're ever going to sell in my home. That's a big factor. Can I do drop shipping, you know, that isn't like Redbubble or Society6? Absolutely you can. It can be a lot more limiting because you're kind of determined on these companies that will integrate with the platforms you're on. Now I know Shopify, um, Squarespace, like I know they have a lot of integration options with a lot of other printing companies and manufacturing companies. So depending on what you want to make, you'll have to do a little research. However, for me, I use Vivia Print for my large poster size prints, which integrates with Etsy. Now how that works is if somebody puts in an order for one of those poster size prints, Vivia Print gets that order, they automatically will print it, ship it, and it's done, and then they will charge my card for the manufacturing costs of it. Now that's super easy, it saves me a lot of trouble, but because I also do a lot of custom products and a lot of other things, I can't integrate or do drop shipping for the majority of my products, but for that one thing I can. So if you know you're a print artist or you can find a manufacturer that will integrate with your platform or will do drop shipping for you, now we're trying to still push sales, right? Got our SEO figured out. We've got this great photography figured out. This is when I think social media, even if you don't have a big following, can come into play. If you have good natural photos that feel a bit more organic, you know, you're not just like, hey, buy my shit. Oh, hey, there's a sale, right? Like that can feel very jarring. That can feel very unnatural on social media. I know this is a point of contention for a lot of people. Social media can be very difficult, especially if you're just starting out, how to get it to work for you. It's another skill set. Don't oversell to your followers. It doesn't feel genuine. Nobody likes it. I don't like it. They don't like it. You're not going to like it. It's going to feel icky, especially if it doesn't work out. Then it's going to really feel icky. You need to think carefully about the responsibility that comes with this power. Don't oversell to them. If you want to post something about a product you're making, make it natural, make it organic. You know, put that product in use. Do a cool photo shoot. You know, that's a lot more interesting. People are going to be excited to see these photos over a, I'm running a 20% sale on my website. Like nobody cares about that post. Nobody's going to share that. Nobody's going to be interested in it. Other than the people who like maybe really wanted to buy that thing, sure. But again, you know, we want to push growth. We want to push natural, organic interactions and engagement. It's going to be better for you. You're going to feel better about it. It's gonna feel less icky. Nobody wants to be oversold to, and nobody wants to oversell to people either. It's it's not a great feeling. So I would say think about your social media page a bit more strategically. You wanna make sure that your Instagram grid looks natural. So when you're putting up your photography that you already took and you put those on your Instagram grid, it's gonna feel good. It's gonna look great. It doesn't even have to be about the sale necessarily. It can just be like, oh, look at this cool thing I made. Also, it's in my shop. You know, it's the second thought. It's an afterthought, right? So trying to do more organic posting feels a lot better to your followers. It doesn't feel like they're being sold to, that they're just a resource, right? Keep these things in mind. Social media obviously is a super powerful tool, right? And it can definitely, you know, generate a ton of sales. You don't want to misuse it either because that can also kill growth in your social media. Now, another question I get all the time is, do I keep my shop open all year or do I do limited drops? These are two very different strategies and it really depends. So I've done both. Keeping my shop open all year round, again, has its benefits, especially like on Etsy, people might not know who I am. Like they might just randomly find my account. So when I'm starting out, I think having it open all year round is probably a bit more beneficial once you get bigger and it's harder to maintain things, you know, you can start driving up demand a bit more, right? So if you're like, okay, my shop's only open for this week, you know, twice a year, whatever, you know, you have a lot of fans, they're waiting for that, you know, they're going to put that on their calendar, right? But when you're just starting out, again, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, as somebody who's done decently okay on social media, I've seen very similar results from doing both, but I also have that following to, you know, fall back on you know, Black Fridays, before the holiday, this is when people are looking to buy things, making sure that you have your shop open during those times. If you have like, say, a lot of Halloween spooky type art, you know, maybe you wanna have your shop open, you know, before Halloween. You know, if you have a lot of like lovey-dovey cute stuff, maybe your products would be, make a really great gift for Valentine's Day. You're gonna wanna have your shop open during that time. Make sure that your shop is available at the optimized times. Okay, let's take a look at analytics. 
So if we take a look at my sales from just this month, November 2023, so far I've made $9,293. So over $10,000 was collected by Etsy, and then 804 of it was sent off for taxes. So I never saw that money, it never hit my account, I never touched it, I don't have to worry about it, love that. Now if we go over and look at the fees for Etsy, $879, quite high, much higher than most platforms, certainly. So you get a listing fee, it's 20 cents per item you sell, transaction fees. So this is a 6.5% fee on everything you sell, goes straight to Etsy. So that's $609 right there. So processing fees is another 3% on top of the other fees. So you're getting essentially a 10% fee right off the bat. Now they've implemented a new thing, the share and save refund. Essentially they will give you 4% back of this essentially 10% for every sale that's driven from your own personal direct traffic. So if I share a link on my social media and somebody clicks that link, they know that that traffic's coming from me. It's a newer feature that they've implemented recently. I think they're trying to compete with some of the other platforms with better percentages. There's definitely a lot more traffic that I bring in myself that isn't really accounted here. Like if they move away from the page and then come back, it doesn't count the 4% towards me. However, this credited my account nine. $98, which, you know, is $98 less dollars than I had to pay in fees, so better than nothing. Shipping obviously is something that's kind of out of your control. You have to pay whatever the shipping is. Um, so make sure that you adjust your shipping prices accordingly because you don't want to overpay for shipping and then that to cut into your profits. So shipping labels, $908 and then marketing. So I've been paying $4 a day in the month of November for some marketing through Etsy. I tried this last year. I didn't have a lot of luck with it. I kind of broke even, but I thought I'd give it a try again. Um, we'll take a closer look at that a little bit later, see how much that actually brought me in as far as a profit. So if we take a look at last year, you can see on Etsy, I made $53,000 overall. Obviously, I paid a lot in fees, I paid a lot in shipping, so a pretty good year overall. If I look at this year, we are not doing as well. So there's a couple reasons for this. Okay, if we look at a breakdown from month to month from last year, you can see I did pretty well. I started off the year really strong. In the middle of the con season, I didn't really update my shop a lot, and you can see that in the number of sales that happened. But then in July, I did a big shop update and I was able to generate a lot of new sales because of it. And then all the way into the holiday season where we did really great in November. November is always a great month for me just because people are shopping around that time. And then in December, I normally close my shop very early, probably on like the 10th, just because you get those people who are like last minute buyers who want to buy things and then get mad that they don't show up for the holidays on time. And that's just not something I want to deal with. So I close my shop very early that month. So we don't normally generate too many sales after the first couple days of December. Overall, I think a pretty good year. I definitely updated with a lot of new products every couple months. Um, and I think that really helped generate sales. Now, if we compare that to this year, I did some things quite differently. I didn't update my shop at all until this month, until November. I just kind of let it sit there, see what it did. I didn't do any advertising. I didn't really do much advertising on social media. I didn't put any new items in the shop. And that really shows. I think it hindered my sales quite massively, which was fine. I was focusing on other things, but you can see the difference. I still made quite a bit of money. I did one small sale in April. You can see how big the difference is there. Also, the economy in the US has been doing quite poorly. So I think that's also a result of less sales that we're having. I think it was especially bad right at the beginning of the year. People were really feeling it. Normally mid to late January is a really good time to make sales as everybody's itching to spend all that money that grandma gave them during the holidays, but not this year for some reason, grandma was broke. And then it went all the way to me moving to LA in mid August where I turned off my shop a couple days into August. And then I kept it closed all the way until the beginning of November, just a couple weeks ago. And I added a ton of new things, things that I'd been working on all year that I hadn't offered in my online shop before and it's holiday season. I don't know if it makes up for keeping my shop closed for those two months. Overall, $28,000 for the year, not too bad. Very down from the year prior, I was feeling quite discouraged at the beginning of the year, but in all honesty, I think it's the majority of it could have been solved for me just producing more products and more work. I wasn't that motivated with everything that was happening in 
the art world at the time. I was feeling quite discouraged with all the talk of AI and stuff like that. Nonetheless, I think we still did quite well and I will not let that discourage me in the future because I still think it is a great space to succeed in. Okay, let's take some questions from the community. So Winnie asks, in your experience, have Itzy ads benefited you? So Itzy ads, in the past, I ran them all year last year. I put $2 a day every single day last year just to see if it worked. And I would say I broke about even. There was some key times when it really worked. So during Black Friday, during the holidays, times when people were shopping and looking for things, that's when I would say that the Itzy ads probably were bringing me in the majority of the money. Other times I was kind of losing money and it kind of balanced out through the entire year. So this year I turned them on just a couple weeks ago in November, which is a big buying time in the United States. And you can see where I started getting views. So Itzy ads brought my shop in about 500 views a day, 400 views on average, something like that, 450 views on average to my shop. Only 240 people actually clicked on my shop from all those views. So it was definitely putting it in front of a lot of people, but not necessarily a lot of people who wanted to click on my page. So that conversion rate isn't great. I got nine orders overall. I spent $63 and made about $648. So about a 10% investment which isn't so bad. Again, if you're running ads, you have the option to run ads on specific items. You can pick which items you want to run ads for. So I would pick all your most popular items, anything that has a really high click ratio, anything that really appeals to general audiences. I don't know who Itzy is serving these ads to, so it's not like you can ensure that your products are going to get put in front of your ideal audience necessarily. So essentially the more popular that item, the more likely the Itzy ads are going to work for you. So I would only put ads on the most popular items in your shop. So I run $4 a day um, just because it's a small number and this has kind of been an experiment and I run it on my two most popular items. So far so good. Both those items are quite expensive, so that's why you see such a high value ratio for it. If they were like $5 items or something and I had only made nine orders, obviously I would not be making my money back, but also maybe more people would have bought it because it was cheaper. So not really sure there. I'll have to test this out further, but those are my results so far. Jessica Parker asks, I'm working on opening an online shop and the things that I'm most concerned about at the moment are a bunch of the logistical minutiae, 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 Minutia? Minutiae. Best practices and supplies needed for mailing out orders. Tips for making listings in a shop. Info on handling taxes and fees. So, great question. We've covered a lot of this already, but I will say if you're worried about taxes and fees, find a platform that handles those automatically on your behalf, because it's a nightmare if you don't. And then as far as like packing materials and stuff like that, I'm gonna put a bunch of Amazon links down below of packing materials that I use that I find really helpful. Um, down below in the description. You know, you're also gonna have a lot more expenses than I think a lot of people realize when you're shipping out stuff. You're going to need packing supplies. So this could be tissue paper, tape, anything that you need to put in the package to kind of make sure things don't get damaged. So keep that in mind. You're gonna wanna make sure you have sturdy boxes so things don't get damaged. This is gonna be another expense. So make sure you keep these in mind when you're calculating what you're selling your item for. These are other expenses. You know, are you gonna put in add-ons? Are you gonna put in a business card, anything else? You know, this is another cost that's associated with it if you wanna do those extra things. So keep that in mind when you're pricing your things. Think about getting a thermal label printer. These things have saved my life. Not only do they not take any ink, you can get the labels for free from USPS. You can also print off a ton of things other than just mailing labels. I use them for marketing. I use them for putting my information on the back of prints. You can print pretty much anything off of them. I would like to know the legality behind fan art. What is allowed and what isn't? Can I sell fan art? Do you recommend using Etsy or just making your own store? Okay, things get really tricky legally when it comes to fan art. Obviously fan art does really well, it's super popular. It sells very easy depending on what it is, especially if it's like very hype in the, you know, the fan population at the time. 
That being said, any company that owns the IP of the thing that you're painting, they can come after you at any time if you're making money on it. Now that doesn't mean every company wants to do that. Some companies view it as free promotion for them. So it can be very risky, but if you're worried about it, I would say, look into those companies of the fan art you're making. See if they've made any public statements. Most of them have. I know a lot of the Western companies are a little bit more stringent on it. I know like Disney and Marvel can be a bit crazy and have been known to go after smaller creators. But I know a lot of the Eastern companies when it comes to anime and stuff, not all of them, view it as free promotion and are very lax on it. So see if they've ever made a public statement. Obviously, if you're looking at more Eastern companies, a lot of these are not in English. But if you can find that source, you know, maybe you can rest easy knowing that that company probably won't go after you. Obviously, they can change their mind at any time and decide that they no longer want people selling fan art of their IP. That being said, kind of keep these in mind and be careful when it comes to selling fan art. Again, if you're on Etsy and people are looking to take down fan art because of that search engine functionality, it's actually a lot easier to find you and people get copyright striked a lot easier on that platform because of that. That being said, if you have a personal website, it's harder for those companies to find you, but it's also harder for your customers to find you. So that's kind of the balancing act that you play in that regard. You know, I definitely know people who have had their work taken down. I know people who have had their personal websites taken down. So even if you have a personal website, it doesn't mean you're necessarily safe. Also, it's, it's probably, again, not legal advice, it's probably unlikely that any company is gonna come after you financially or like really legally, you're probably gonna get a cease and desist and have your listings taken down. Um, that being said, if you start making like super bank, you know, that could be a different story. A lot of companies really like the community contribution. A lot of other ones are very strict on it. So, so I would say proceed with caution. Miss Foxy asks, for those of us who rather not use Etsy, mostly due to having fees that aren't really small creator friendly, what other online shops would you recommend to figure out what your audience would like to buy from you in the first place? How do you go about that? Do you send out surveys? So this might not be what you wanna hear, but I think unfortunately Etsy, who I do agree has fees that are way higher than they should be. I do think they are the most small creator friendly website and that's because of everything else they do. You know, the auto tax collection, the discounted rates on shipping that they give, the way that they have the search engine functionality is a huge one that a lot of websites just don't have. Everybody's already on that website. It's super easy to get discovered and sell your stuff through Etsy as somebody who's just starting out. Um, again, I really Realize that's probably not the answer you want to hear. If you're not a small creator, then I think that it becomes more realistic to start branching out to other platforms, but trying to get that basis, the, a platform that everybody is already on and already buying from is just so valuable. That being said, if you're having trouble making a profit with those fees, then I think maybe the issue is pricing, trying to push yourself to doing something a bit more high end or art prints or things with better pricing margins, right? That way you can price it a little bit higher and make up for those fees. You know, maybe you're pricing things at, you know, double what it costs you to make. Really, you need to be pricing at about 400 times what it makes to be a good business practice, for example, right? I think 400% of whatever the manufacturing costs is like a good starting point even though the platform is a little bit of the issue. There was one time a couple years ago where I had like 50 orders I sent out in a single day and they all just disappeared. That was devastating, but luckily I priced my things accordingly enough where like, you know, I might not have made very much profit, but I didn't lose money. And on to the second part of your question, how to figure out what your customers wanna buy? I would say, who cares? I would say make things that you think are really cool. Like for me, I'm super picky when I go to buy something. Like I have to really like something to like hand over my money and like purchase it online, right? You're making something that you're impressed with enough that you're like, I would buy this. Then I think those customers are gonna come. If you're still having issues, again, I would take a look at like, you know, is your SEO tags working? Is your photography working? Like make sure that the product is good. And if the product's good, make sure all those other things are good. And then the customers will come. You know, if you're just making a product because you think people like it and will buy it, that won't feel genuine. And people are going to recognize that because it's never as good if you're like really into the thing. So definitely make things that you're into, that you're excited about, and you're gonna find an audience for that because things you think are cool, there's people out there that also think that thing is cool, right? Do you advise for customers to pay for shipping? Because honestly, depending on the product and country, there are many different shipping rates and people would rather not have to pay more on the shipping than the actual products. How do you balance that with the cost of your products? Of course, nobody wants to pay for shipping, but no matter what you buy, 
you're paying for shipping. Whether it's included in the price or not, it's just not possible for the customer not to pay for the shipping or you're losing money. And as a business, that doesn't make any sense. If I can, if it's in the States, I add the shipping price directly to the price. So there's no confusion about what they're gonna pay. I know the shipping prices can be a little obscure sometimes depending on the platform and that can be really frustrating for the customer. For international shipping, I have to add the shipping because it, the shipping rates wild so differently and they're so high. So I make sure any country with similar shipping rates from where I am have that rate locked in and then anything within the States, I have the shipping rate kind of built in to the price. So that's kind of how I do it um, without getting any weird logistical issues. Kennedy Wilson asks, how do you handle tax write-offs? Oh, okay, so uh, I'm not a tax expert. Uh, this is not legal advice. Um, write off everything. So what I mean by that is like, if you drive to the post office, that gas you just paid for, that's write offable. Anything you buy, you know, it's all write offable. So what I do typically is I have a credit card specifically just for business expenses. So anything that's business related, if I have to put gas in the car, if I have to buy tape, if I have to buy shipping boxes, if I have to travel to an in-person event, that's all write offable. So I put it on that credit card and then it's really easy to kind of separate it at the end of the year when I'm doing my tax write offs. That being said, if you have, you know, some space in your house that's just for packing your, you know, your online orders, I would say if it has anything remotely to do with your company, you know, figure out if you can write it off, figure out a way to separate those expenses from like your other day expenses. And that will make your life a lot easier during tax season. These are our products. Guys, take a look at the price. Marketing as an artist is a super important skill these days to have. I'm not naturally a good salesperson, but your boys gotta eat. And this is one of the ways I get to stay home and paint my little pictures. I wanna thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you wanna see any more topics on art and marketing, please let me know in the comments down below. And outros are hard, so bye. Thanks, like and subscribe or whatever. Now, I leave it all up to you. You know, also super unrelated, but my shop just recently opened. So, you know, if you want to help feed this guy who eats a lot, like a lot, like look at this, look, look at look at him. He just doesn't end. Um, you know, maybe check it out. Maybe check it out. No pressure, you know, super unrelated to this video at all, but you know, it's, it's a link down below.